Hi. Uh, thank you very much for being here today. In the back, can you can you hear me well? Okay. Uh, my name is Carlos Ortega. I'm a curator at Rancho Los Cerritos Museum and Historic Site. Uh, welcome to the first lecture uh, of our Roots in California Concept of Home speaker series. Uh, the title of the lecture is Suddenly We Are Mexican Americans, uh, The White Anglo Settler Imagination and National Identity Constructs in Southern California between 1850s and the 1930s. Uh, the speaker series is sponsored by California Humanities and it aims to provide further context uh, uh, for the stories featured in our current exhibition within the larger history of Mexican and Mexican Americans uh, uh, in Southern California. Uh, today we have a very special guest speaker, uh, someone I, I love working with and uh, admire profusely. Uh, her name is Andrea Guerrero, who is the humanities consultant uh, that Rancho Los Cerritos partnered with uh, for our current exhibition, and the exhibition that focuses on the Mexican and Mexican Americans living at this historic site over 100 years ago, uh, between the 1890s and the 1920s. Uh, Andrea Guerrero earned her MA in Art History at California State University Long Beach in 2020. Um, her research interests include the art and history of contemporary Latin Americans and U.S. Uh, brown indigenous people of color uh, with an emphasis on aesthetic and historical strategies uh, the, developed to question and redefine marginalized subjectivities. Um, Andrea was the lead consulting historian for a highly acclaimed exhibition titled Ink Stories and Skin at the Museum of Latin American Art in Long Beach in 2018 and she was the recipient of the 2020 Outstanding Thesis Award uh, for the College of the Arts at Cal State Long Beach. Uh, please help me welcome her and give her a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you, Carlos, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, so yes, my name is Andrea Guerrero, and this lecture is uh, in conjunction with the exhibition Roots in California, Concepts of Home, which um, is currently on view, and if you haven't seen it, I would encourage you all to go see it. Um, it's really insightful, and um, I think with the benefit of having listened to this lecture and maybe going to see it again, um, you might have a different experience of this show. Um, so before getting started, and Carlos kind of stole my thunder by showing it, um, I would like to first acknowledge um, the land. And I'd like to acknowledge that this lecture is presented on the unceded land of the Tongva Gabrileño and Ahachiman Fuaneño nations in honor of the ancestors who were removed and are exterminated by genocidal colonizing campaigns and in solidarity with Tongva Gabrileño and Ahachiman Fuaneño people living and thriving today. I encourage those with the power to do so to give the land back. So to start, um, the exhibition currently on view pulls from oral histories that have been collected by the ranch um, from previous tenants who lived at the adobe home here, um, like Carlos said, about 100 years ago. Um, here we have two images of children who were possibly the children of the tenants. Um, it's a little bit unclear from the information about the images, but regardless of whether or not these children were the children of the tenants, um, I would like you all to keep these images in mind um, as I move forward through the lecture. So when I started working with Carlos on the conceptual um, framework for the exhibition, one of the questions that kept coming up a lot was this question of what was and is the Mexican-American experience. Um, and as a person of Mexican ancestry living in the U.S., I thought, you know, who else better to answer this question? Um, but I found myself just coming up with more questions instead of answers. And these are the questions that instead of thinking or questioning what was and is the Mexican-American experience, I urge you guys to consider the following questions. What constitutes the Mexican-American identity? Who is defining this identity and for what purpose or purposes? And what are the consequences 
of that discourse. I think these questions would give us, or answers to these questions, or at least um, a discussion in an attempt to answer these questions, would give us a little bit more insight into the lived experience of the tenants here and of Mexican Americans across Southern California. So to start, I, what I think is necessary is to acknowledge three things. The first two is to acknowledge that the term Mexican American is a reductive and simplistic exonym, which has historically been haphazardly used to refer to brown indigenous people of the Americas, mixed race people, and in some cases, white, Spanish, and Spanish heritage Mexican settlers. So as you can tell from that bullet point alone, there's a lot going on there. It's not clear and the identities start to get mixed and suddenly you're not really sure who is or isn't a Mexican American. The second thing I'd like to acknowledge is that the Mexican American experience or identity, if there is one, in Southern California is predicated on the California genocide and anti-black segregationist discourse and legislation happening across the United States at the time. And I will um, speak about that a little bit more further on. The third thing I would like to acknowledge is that Mexico and the U.S. are both white settler nations. So this is really important to acknowledge and understand because I think sometimes we confuse the term Mexican for this broad cultural, um, ethnic, and foregrounding a very specific race. Um, and that's just not the case. Um, Mexico is a white Hispanic settler nation. Mexico was also colonized and it experienced similar things that happened in the Anglo colonized part of the United States. Um, for example, um, the land was colonized. There was an attempt to um, eradicate the indigenous populations and there was enslavement of black people. And through these three things, these settler nations were able to form. So, another thing to be considerate of is the shift in population or the shift in demographics that happened in California following two very specific events. And that's the end of the war with Mexico or the US-Mexican War as most people know it and the California genocide. So the mid 1800s was a period of complete transformation for Southern California. Um, at the end of the war, the 1848 Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo uh, settled the war between the US and the Mexican government. And in doing so, it offered the transference of land from one settler nation to another. So no longer was Mexico the um, in control of the territories that now compromise California. In 1849, the California State Constitution was drafted, and this specific document almost completely challenged the stipulations in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and, we'll, and I will talk about that again and. Um, Talk about the importance of why those two things happening so quickly um, creates this confusion about ethnicity and national identity. In 1850, California officially was recognized as the 31st state of the U.S. And as you can see, the Constitution was drafted way before um, it even became a state. And in 1851, the California Land Act was enacted. And this, again, goes in... Um, stark contrast to the stipulations in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. The California genocide happened simultaneously, and this was enabled by the 1848 gold rush in which settlers, white Anglo settlers from the east, start moving to the west, start moving to California in search for wealth, gold, and land. Between 1850 and the 1860s, California governors call for armed mobilization against native peoples. These are California government officials who are calling for the eradication of indigenous peoples 
throughout the state. So, one of the questions that always comes to my mind, right, is how does race factor into all of this? And the only conceivable answer that I can think of is that it factors in whatever way they want it to, because race is made up. And I know for some of you, this is probably, you're thinking, what, I have a race, I am this, I am that. Um, but the way that I'm talking about it now is in terms of who gets to define it and why. So for the purposes of this lecture, the Mexican American identity is not a self-imposed identity. As I mentioned previously, it is an exonym, which means that an outside group is creating this label, this identity, for a group of people that exist here already. So these identities defined by the white Anglo settler nation um, can be summed up pretty simply. And it is that the relation to the settler nation is based on the understanding that the race is separate from white. And at the time in early Southern California, you have two very distinct racial scripts. And one is the native racial script and the black racial script. Both of those, as defined by the white Anglo settler, are non-white. They, the proximity to whiteness doesn't exist. And therefore, it is justifiable to eradicate the native and to enslave the black citizen. The Mexican American identity fluctuates between these two things. And this is where it gets it starts to get confusing because the relation to the settler nation for the Mexican American identity is based on proximity of individuals of a certain individual's race to whiteness. So now it, it's like it's a case by case basis, whether or not you are Mexican American, whether or not that means you are white, whether or not that means you have any claims to indigeneity. And so as you can probably start to see, this is getting confusing, right? What does any of this mean? And again, you're probably looking at these definitions and thinking, these are really reductive ways to describe these identities. And you're correct. They are reductive. They are meant to be reductive. They're meant to be simplistic so that it's easier to separate people and to justify certain actions that are being committed against others. Um, hopefully most of you have seen this painting. This is American Progress by John Gass from 1872. Um, and it's actually owned by the Autry Museum of the American West, which is right here. You can probably go and see it. Um, this painting, if you have never seen it before, um, I wish I was you. And I'm sorry that I'm making you see it now. <laughs> This painting is a personification of Manifest Destiny. It is an image that is demonstrating the Anglo settlers' right to conquest the Western territories of what is now considered the United States. Um, as you can see in the painting, I'm not gonna go into a super detailed analysis. Um, there's a couple of things that I want you guys to notice in the painting. Um, it might be a little bit difficult to see, but there are two groups of Native Americans in this painting. The first one is very tiny. It's right below the personification of American progress. It is a group of Native Americans near some teepees, and they're flailing their arms, possibly dancing, possibly fleeing. There is no indication of what's going on there. The second is at the bottom left corner, there is a more defined group of natives running away. One of them is looking directly at this personification of American progress and manifest destiny. And it is the only figure in the painting to be acknowledging her and looking at her directly. And I, every time I look at this painting, I looked straight at this one individual this guy right here, looking straight at her and imagining what they must be thinking. 
And to give you guys kind of a sense of what was probably going on in the minds of the native people, I'm going to show you a series of excerpts from newspapers, amongst other things, that will give you a clearer idea of how natives were being perceived at the time. The first is this quote by Governor Peter H. Burnett from 1851. Governor Burnett said that a war of extermination will continue to be waged between the races until the Indian race becomes extinct must be, must be expected. While we cannot anticipate this result, but with painful regret that inevitable destiny of the race is beyond the power or wisdom of man to avert, which is a really interesting way of saying it's gonna happen, right? We're, they're gonna be eradicated. There's, we have no control. This is, a pro, this is a process that's out of our hands. And this is part of the evolution of the country, right? No matter how um, horrible and how violent it will be. This is an excerpt from the Los Angeles Star from 1856, and it reads, Cannot some plan be devised to remove the Indians from our midst? Could they not be removed to a plantation in the vicinity of our city and put under the control of an overseer and not be permitted to enter the city, except by special permit of the super superintendent? Our citizens who are in want of their labor could apply direct to the superintendent for such help as they might want and when their work was finished, permit them to return to their home, right? This is starting to sound very similar to um, guest worker programs or the ways that certain people are valued as laborers um, over anything else. And this is interesting because this is a call for the removal of Native Americans through um, what you might call legal ways, right? This is kind of like um, showing some mercy, right? Could we not possibly come up with laws or some kind of policy that will put them, you know, not kill them, but put them somewhere else so that we may have access to them and use their labor whenever we want. And once we're done, they can go back. We're not going to hurt them, but they're here for us. And this is kind of the language that is often talked about in terms of how these things become um, systemic practices. And what is not often talked about are the actual ways that these things happened, such as this excerpt from the Alta California newspaper in 1862. It reads, here is well known, there are a number of men in this county who have for years made it their profession to capture and sell Indians, the price ranging from $30 to $150 according to quality. Some, have some hard stories are told of those engaged in the trade in regards to the manner of the capture of the children. It is even asserted that there are men engaged in it who do not hesitate when they find a rancheria well stocked with young Indians to murder in cold blood all the ones all the old ones in order that they may be safely that they may safely possess themselves of the offspring this is more in line with how the eradication of native americans happened it happened violently and it happened with absolutely zero hesitation and as you can see they weren't just worried about older Native Americans, but they were targeting children. And the reasons that they were targeting children is because it is easier to raise someone to be docile, to not challenge, than to change someone whose beliefs in the importance of their life it have already been established. And through these actions, the California genocide occurred. The indigenous California population at the onset of California statehood is estimated to have been at 150,000 people 
By the 1870s, the population decreased to 30,000 people, and roughly 20,000 people had been enslaved. The population would continue to plummet due to ongoing genocidal efforts, and by 1880 reached 16,277. From a population of 150,000 to 16,000, um, that is quite a drop. And so this is, these are the attitudes that Mexican Americans are finding themselves within, right? This is how Native people are being treated. And so how possibly are Mexicans or Mexican Americans, how will they be treated? And will this have any impact on them? The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which ended the war between Mexico and the U.S., gave some relief to Mexican people who were living in the country. One of the stipulations in the treaty said that in the territories, in the said territories of California um, and the other southwestern states or territories that now belong to the U.S., property of every kind now belonging to Mexicans not established there shall be inviolably respected. The present owners, the heirs of these, and all Mexicans who may hereafter acquire said property by contract shall enjoy with respect to it guarantees equally ample as if the same belonged to citizens of the United States. Essentially, the land ownership of Mexicans was to be respected. And furthermore, they were to be treated almost exactly as citizens. Another stipulation in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo actually offers Mexican citizens U.S. citizenship if they so desired. And if they didn't decide, within a year or so, they automatically became U.S. citizens. So this, these are the agreements that Mexican Americans have in mind moving forward living now in a land that is no longer Mexico and is the United States. So, how do, how do things progress? In the state of California, they don't care. The stipulations in the treaty are not honored and the rights that have been awarded to Mexicans are almost immediately infringed upon. For example, once the California Constitution was drafted, they were very clear in their language as to which Mexicans would be given citizenship and the ability to vote. And the California Constitution at the time read, every white male citizen of the United States and every white male citizen of Mexico who shall have elected to become a citizen of the United States under the Treaty of Peace exchanged and ratified at Querétaro, this is the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, on the 30th day of May, 1848, of the age of 21 years, who shall have been a resident of state six months next preceding the election and the county or, and the country, county or district in which he claims his vote 30 days, shall be entitled to vote at all elections, which are now or hereafter, may be authorized by law. Essentially, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo offers citizenship and the rights that come with citizenship to all Mexicans who were living in this territory. The California Constitution limited those rights to just white male Mexicans. So, remember in the beginning when I brought up the Mexican-American identity, what does race have to do with it, what does ethnicity have to do with it, what does nationality have to do with it, it's still up for debate, except in this case, Me Mexicans, that identity can be white. It has a proximity to whiteness, unlike indigeneity and blackness. Those things are separate. But the Mexican identity is fluid. 
Furthermore, in 1851, the California, um, in California, Congress passed the Land Act. This act had very specific stipulations about who was able to claim ownership of land that was now in the state of California. The treaty honored the land of anyone who had been living there. The California Land Act didn't disagree with the treaty, but it created different criteria for who and what kind of documentation was necessary in order for that land to be valid for someone else. This meant that if you were a Mexican person who had lived on this land for generations, generations on a home, you have no documentation or your documentation is in Spanish, you would have to submit whatever records you have to a committee for them to review and decide whether or not those were valid enough to guarantee your ownership to the land. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo did not say any of this. It said, inviolably respected. The state of California said no. So already here, we're starting to see a pattern of what kind of Mexicans will be granted rights and citizenship? And what we can see is that the type of Mexicans that were given these things, that were honored, were the ones who were close in proximity to whiteness. That means skin color, that means language, that means religion. If these things were similar to the white Anglo settler, it was easier for people of Mexican descent or Mexican ancestry to gain the rights that the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo promised. So, it's pretty easy to see how perhaps some Mexican Americans would have considered moving their proximity to whiteness as close as they possibly could, which means rejecting their language, rejecting their heritage, rejecting their ancestors, their indigeneity, rejecting anything that could possibly be read as non-white. Now this is not just a result or a consequence of the Anglo settler demanding certain things from the now Mexican American citizen. The Mexican American citizen like I mentioned before, was already living in a colonized nation. They were living in a settler state in Mexico. And in Mexico, there was already a social stratification based on race. And we see that in the Casta paintings um, from the 18th century and 19th century. This one um, by Luisa Mena shows the actual um, hierarchical placements of specific races in Mexico. Now one thing that the Spaniards kind of had on the uh, British or Anglo-European settlers was that they were weirdly obsessed with intermarriages and offsprings um, to the point that they created these um, systems of categorization that they would send back to Spain. So these are paintings being produced by elite Mexicans, which often were of Spanish heritage, were born in Spain, um, were not brown, they were white. And these are being sent back to Spain to give the monarchy there an idea of what is happening in their new colonized territories. Um, and so as you can see, at the very bottom, right above the fruits, are people with darker skin complexions. This is where you get the very um, racist terms such as mulatto, right? Um, and so Mexicans living in the now territory of California 
already had this ingrained in their mind. This was part of their society. This is how their society treated different races. And what they see is that blackness will not get them anything. Blackness puts them at the bottom. And therefore, they are more inclined to reject it. From 1878 until 1952, there were 52 racial prerequisite cases in which the petitioner had to establish his or her eligibility for citizenship. Of these, only one involved an individual who argued that he was black and hence eligible for citizenship. The other 51 plaintiffs sued to be declared legally white. Now, what's really interesting about this is that at this moment in time, because slavery was in the process of being eradicated, freed slaves were given the opportunity to claim citizenship and vote. If you claimed blackness, you were more likely to be granted citizenship as a Mexican American. However, only one of 52 plaintiffs dared to do so. And it's it's almost depressing, right? Because what you begin to understand is that these people who are starting to fall into their new national identity, this identity of the Mexican American, are already willing to adopt the racist ideologies of the Anglo settler. So much so that they're willing to reject blackness and ind indigeneity for safety, for the ability to be citizens, to own land, to work, to be left relatively alone. And so this is what I mean when I say that the Mexican American identity is predicated on anti-blackness and Native American genocide. So with that in mind, we have to start considering, okay, so the white Anglo settler can't really figure out how to position these new people. They've been given rights, they've been promised things, those things have been taken, they have been altered, they have been changed, certain laws start to reflect different ideas, and yet people still don't really know who they are and how they factor into the United States. Until about 1890, when once the Mexican American has become established under all these new laws, under all these new policies, we start to see a pattern, right? Remember that quote from the newspaper urging the state to do something about removing Native Americans and having them be labor, right? They're, they're not killed. They're simply removed and placed somewhere where they can easily be picked up and used as labor. This same notion was applied to the Mexican American. And this is where we start to see this um, connection between Mexican American people and labor. Now, I know that these past excerpts were pretty heavy, um, and the entire conversation so far has been a little bit grim. It's impossible to have this conversation without mentioning these things. And so, to alleviate the mood a little bit, I wanted to include my favorite meme. Um, in 1890 to 1930, Mexican Americans and Mexican migrants become a major labor force in the United States, right? And this is in part due to the rise of industry and commerce that's happening throughout Southern California. And as the meme says, el problema es el capitalismo, the problem is capitalism. That's my opinion, I thought it was funny. And that's me in a very casual conversation. This might not be too casual, but the point, the point remains. So let's talk about the surplus population and labor exploitation. 
at the time, in the 1900s, in the 1900s, Northern California was having a very different experience in terms of labor, immigration, and um, unionizing. In early 1900s, San Francisco um, had a stronghold of trade unionism and success of unionized labor. Wages were 30% higher than elsewhere in the West Coast. And unions throughout the northern part of California had a lot of leverage over their um, employers. They were able to negotiate wages. They were able to withhold labor and manage to get what they wanted beyond wages, um, such as working conditions, better working conditions, um, lower or fewer out our work week. In Southern California, in the same time, the early 1900s, Los Angeles is a developing city with lots of opportunity for commerce and business. Um, because it is a relatively new city, um, the process needs to be fast, right? They gotta catch up. And so, how do you do that? Not by paying people fair wages, right? Um, so, Los Angeles, at the time, was extremely anti-union. Um, low wages throughout Southern California um, were standardized for manual labor jobs. And in 1910, high tensions between capitalists and workers started to become a problem. However, the agricultural industry was very fond of these low wages and cheap labor, and they actually their discourse on this specific labor was a little bit different. First, I want to, I want you guys to think about, right, this notion of a surplus population and the labor that they offer to the state. So we now know that the Mexican American identity is unclear. However, what is clear is its relation to labor. And if there is all these anti-union sentiments, right? Capitalists are fighting with the workers. They don't want to give them fair pay. They don't want to give them better working conditions. They don't want to give them less hours. So what do they do? So outsource right, to people who do not have the kind of rights to demand those things. Harrison Gray Otis was the president and general manager of the Times Mirror Company. He was also the editor of the Los Angeles Times from 1882 to 1917. And while there are a lot of things that this man said about unions, um, there is just this one excerpt that I would like to share with you all from a book written in 1963 that detailed his staunch position against unions. During the 90s, the 1890s, Otis had become the most savage and effective enemy of labor unionism in the country. And as a result of his doings, Los Angeles was and is today the outstanding open shop town in the United States the white spot of the industrial map of the country. Otis fought the unions tooth and nail. Often he picked fights. In the times referring to organized workers, he used such terms as sluggers, union rowdies, hired trouble breeders, gas pipe ruffians, strong arm gang, some of which at certain times, no doubt, were justified. And I thought this quote was really interesting because this is a perception of this man from a contemporary. Right, this is 19, um, oh, I'm sorry, it says 1963, but it's 1963. I will have to check that again. The point is, this, these, this is how this person is being perceived by another white Anglo settler, right? Um, so as you can see, the interest in moving away from unionized labor, organized labor, is strong in Los Angeles and throughout Southern California. 
the Los Angeles Times had a big influence on other newspapers across Southern California. And so these ideas about um, anti-union, um, they were scattered throughout the region. And so it was really difficult for people throughout Southern California to demand the same kind of workers' rights that were won in the North, in Northern California. So with the inability to succeed and gain those rights, uh, right, people are not working. And in addition to people not working, by the 1910s and the 1920s, there is a labor shortage. By 1917, the U.S. has entered the First World War. And there are needs for workers across all industries. In Southern California, the industry that demanded the most labor was the agricultural industry. And this was um, mostly due for these two reasons. The fact that the U.S. had entered World War I and the fact that the Immigration Act had just become federal mandate. This act restricted immigration and denied entry to Asian immigrants and others based on based largely on literacy. So a lot of Mexican workers were also barred entry because they didn't speak English. They didn't pass the literacy test. But because the agriculture industry in Southern California was so desperate for workers, the 1917 and 1921 first federal guest worker program was created. And this was a, fe this was a federal program. This affected the entire country. And it granted unskilled Mexicans temporary worker status, bypassing the immigration restrictions enforced by the Immigration Act of 1917. That meant that Mexican migrants were given a pass. And this pass was mostly offered to them because the agricultural industry assumed that these workers were here on a temporary basis, that they would eventually go back, that they don't need all of those rights that the organized labor unions were fighting for because they're here to work and return to Mexico. They are, um, they're not meant to be in the country permanently. So the solution to the labor shortage in Southern California was Mexican migrant workers. This is an image of workers from here at Rancho Los Cerritos. I'm not claiming that these workers were um, brought here by the uh, federal guest worker program, but they are workers who were here at the time that that program was enacted. Um, and they are workers who experienced life as Mexican Americans, Mexican migrants, Mexican nationals, some kind of relation to Mexico at the time that all of these things are happening, that the Mexican American identity is starting to form, that these practices, right, these standardized government practices and policies are being enforced and affecting certain groups of people. And in this case, Mexican migrants, Mexican Americans, Mexican heritage people, anyone who has anything to do with Mexico. Now, for the sake of time, I'm gonna condense this next part um, and just follow along if you guys have any questions, uh, save it for the end and I promise I will talk if I can. One of the things that made the guest worker program possible was um, the offer of worker housing. So because these people could not come here and buy property because they were not citizens, they had to be placed somewhere. Uh, throughout Los Angeles, there were unplanned suburbs for workers. These unplanned suburbs were basically um, en empty lots of land where workers were able to go and build and construct these, um, these residencies were not checked. Nobody came in to make sure that things were up to a certain code, a certain standard. This was a very DIY style community, right? Uh, 
However, this is for actual citizens in Los Angeles, these unplanned suburbs. What we see here at the ranch is very similar. It is not an empty lot where people came and built the adobe home. Um, this home was built prior by Native Americans um, and was it was turned into worker housing um, in the late 1800s. Now, you have all been here. Hopefully, you have seen the um, adobe home. If you have not, I urge you to go and take a stroll. It is quite beautiful. Um, the gardens are amazing. The structure um, in its 1930s style is very beautiful to look at. However, when this was a residential home for workers, this is what the ranch looked like. As you can see, it is in a deteriorating condition. This is a home or a residence that needs a lot of work. Um, and similar to these unplanned suburbs, the tenants had to make a lot of the renovations themselves. Often even building certain things that would make the home accessible or useful, such as stairs, um, kitchens, and even um, furniture. So what we see here is a lack of concern for the living conditions of these workers. And this is something that becomes very uh, also standard practice for a lot of worker housing across Southern California, and I would argue across the entire United States. Worker housing specifically for migrant workers, Mexican American workers, has almost always looked like this. If you go through a low income working class neighborhood today in Los Angeles, in Orange County, even parts of Long Beach here, you will see structures that look remarkably similar. Structures that are not maintained or taken care of when workers are living in them. Now, these unplanned suburbs, not the ranch, right? The suburbs that were offered in um, areas up in the greater Los Angeles area, these places were often They were not considered, right, uh, proper housing. This, however, is. This is part of the ranch. It is a home that the Bixby family corporation built. Therefore, this building should have been up to standard, up to code, and yet it was not. And the people who lived here had to handle that themselves. If you go and see the exhibition um, and you read some of the accounts from the oral histories, you can see who exactly which tenants and their families worked on the adobe home to create an actual home for themselves. Um, and so, as it says here, the workers who resided in these unplanned suburbs were usually free to construct as best as they could entire families often participated with wives and children hoping to pound in nails or hand over supplies and this sounds like a very um, fun family activity right like get the kids together uh, make some lunch and let's pound some nails and make a staircase right sounds great except these people are already working they are on the land of a ranch where they work where they spend their time already performing labor only to go back to their homes and perform additional labor just so that they can live comfortably. In the 1930s, the Adobe home was no longer worker housing. Information about what happened to the workers um, is sparse. There really is not a lot of detail. But what we do have details of are the renovations that happened to the Adobe home. So let me just show you the last picture one more time. This is what the Adobe home looked like when workers were living there. Workers who maintained the ranch, workers who maintained the land here, workers who worked on the 
um, adjacent country club workers who work in adjacent businesses, other ranches around this part of Long Beach. This is what it looked like when they lived here. When the Bigsby's decided to take it back, this is what it looked like. And I know that this may seem a little bit like a cosmetic, uh, superficial um, critique, but I urge you to consider, right? Why certain people are justifiably put in these kinds of living situations and why other people feel that they do not deserve those living conditions and have the means to fix that. So if you walk through the Adobe today, right, beautiful, um, lively, as it should be, as a home should be. And so I want to conclude with the following statements on the Mexican American identity. And that is that it is relative to whiteness. It has always been relative to whiteness. And even today, it is still relative to whiteness. The Mexican American identity or subjectivity is a twice colonized subject. Really what the term says is the Hispanic colonial subject dash Anglo colonial subject. It has historically been defined, restricted, and changed at the mercy of white Anglo settlers, right? Depending what they want, what rights they want to offer to others, what rights they want to deny to others, this identity changes, which is interesting, right? Because certain identities based on the white Anglo imagination are fixed. They cannot be changed, right? Think of binary identities such as gender. And this identity continues to be warped and man manipulated by the settler nation. So back to the image of the children in front of the adobe home. These children, whether or not they were children of tenants, I think one of them might have been, um, these children grew up with all of these things happening while they are developing their own sense of self and identity. And their sense of self and identity is based on what they offer to the Anglo settler, what they offer in terms of labor, what they offer in terms of, I mean, what else? It's simply labor. And so considering this, right, these are kids growing up 100 years ago. And like I said, this is a experience and identity that continues to be warped and manipulated by the settler nation. A couple years ago, um, when Trump was elected president, he attempted to rescind um, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, the DACA program that offered um, children who entered the country illegally a chance at employment, basically. Therefore, these children who entered the country illegally within the past 30, 40, 50 years, I believe, um, they were finally recognized as providing some benefit to the country. And that was economic. That was labor. And that Obama gave people that, right? Obama gave undocumented citizens those rights. He gave them those protections based on the labor that they were able to offer. Now that labor is a little bit different. Um, it wasn't just manual labor that they could offer. It is now intellectual labor, it is creative labor. It is any kind of labor that creates money, income, um, that can be put back into the US economy. And that program affected Mexican-American kids, right? What 
some would consider to be the 1.5 generation, not so much the first generation Mexican Americans, second generation Mexican Americans, but the kids who came in as children. And I think it's significant to remember this because th these identities, they may seem abstract and, you know, like it doesn't really matter, right? Mexican American, Hispanic, Latino, Latinx, Chicano, Chicanx, all of these identities and terms start to become um, interchangeable to a lot of people. And the one thing that I would urge you to take away from this lecture is that it, these terms are not interchangeable for the people who are being directly affected. Um, and I would also urge you to consider any kind of relation that you might have to the settler state, right? How is your own identity, how is your own identity shaped by the white Anglo imagination and even the Hispanic, uh, the white Hispanic imagination? How your identity is, is restricted or defined by others and how you have to navigate the world based on that limited identity. Um, so with that, I leave you with this lecture, and I believe we have about 30 minutes for Q&A. Um, so, um, Carlos, you want to? No, no. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> and, uh, definitely, if there's any questions, now is the time. Yes. What, what would you say about, about the term Chicano, which is a self-imposed identity? Yes, so the term Chicano, I think, deserves a little bit more um, of a critical eye, only because it is a self-imposed um, identity marker, right? However, the term still has loosely been linked to just Mexican-Americans. Um, the narrative that's created for the Chicano identity is based on that, right? Like you're, um, you being some kind of satellite citizen of Mexico um, in the U.S. However, there are a lot of people who identify as Chicano who also are um, members of native communities, right? Um, some Tongva, Gabrielenio, Ahachimen, um, uh, I'm gonna miss that one, but a lot of the native groups here in Southern California and in the rest of the Southwest and New Mexico, um, they identify as Chicano as well. And so it is, it would be of more help to directly talk to those people about those terms, right? Because the Mexican American identity is defined by the white Anglo. This Chicano identity is defined by a group of people who have some similarities. And so there, that would be a different, um, a different conversation because it is something that people are able to identify for themselves. And so that I think would be a completely different conversation, but still, um, you know, like thinking about how the Chicano identity still is defined partly in terms of its relation to whiteness, right? The Chicano is not a white person. And so it's still in some ways foregrounding the white settler um, in, in this identity. So do you mind if I ask how you identify? Um, that's one question. And then, um, and, and then as that white person, um, what is appropriate for me? Like, is it appropriate for me to, um, to ask someone how they identify? I feel comfortable asking you because we're in this context. But, you know, just say out on the street or meeting someone casually, you know, what, what is your perspective on that? Sure. So, to answer the first question, um, I identify as an indigenous person of Nahua descent. Um, I for a long time identified as a Mexican, and even before then I identified as a Mexican American. Um, now I choose to not center my identity on the settler nation, right? 
the cellular nation has no um, control over the limitations and restrictions of my own identity. So I've, cho mm -hmm. I've chosen to remove that from the way I see myself, the way I think of myself, and instead focus more and connect more to my indigenous background. I was on the phone with my grandmother the other day. She called me to um, uh, wish me a happy birthday. And the entire, her first entire sentence was in Nawa. And I couldn't respond because I was not taught Nawa. That is the indigenous language that was taken from me. But thankfully, it has survived through my grandmother and the rest of my family that is in Mexico. And so, therefore, I choose to identify as an indigenous person of Nahuatl descent. Um, your second question about um, whether it is appropriate to ask people um, how they identify. I think if you are talking to someone that you know already, someone that you have an established connection with, asking them how they identify would probably be a good idea, right? Because this is a person you care about, this is a person that you want to respect and honor. And so asking them, right, like just how you asked me, how do you identify in terms of race or nationality or ethnicity or any of these things, a combination of these things. If you were to just meet some random person on the street, I would advise you against just asking them uh, who they are and how they identify. But I think it is a, um, it's not as scary of a question, I think, for people that you already know. I kind of like to relate to her question. I would think, just like a medical activity that somebody might be performing, if you don't know them, are you going to ask about it? Right. If you don't know how they identify, you don't have to ask a perfect stranger. Maybe somebody that you appreciate or care about, you might want to know more. But they'll reveal that as they feel, as they enter. And the first part of the question is like, you approach anybody on the street like you would anybody else. You treat them respectfully as a person, as a human. They're not this or that. They're a human. Correct. We are all human. We are all human, but I also think that there is some substance to um, your question, right? Because at the same time, even though right, we are all human, we all believe red, um, these categories have been placed on us. So even though race is made up, the effects and consequences of those ideas are very real. So, it you know you you also don't want to go up to someone and completely erase those aspects of themselves because they do have an impact on their everyday lived experience, right? You don't want to go up to someone and say, "Well, um, I don't see color," or um, you know, "You're not X Y Z to me. You're just a person." Um, because you would be erasing part of their specific cultural or ethnic identity or racial identity. And these things, right, again, even though they are made up, even though um, the stratifications of race and the um, definitions of race are based on the white settler imagination, they have very real impacts on the people that you talk to and meet every day. Um, but yes, I agree, you don't want to just go up to someone and say, Hey, what like what are you? Right, that's not a question that you want to. Um, my sister worked at Coffee Bean for three years, and almost every day somebody would come up to her and ask her, "What are you?" Yes. Um, I was gonna say, do you think that's a good question for white people to ask themselves? Yes, absolutely. I think that is a that's a perfect question for white people to ask themselves because. Um, one of the things that I didn't get a chance to mention is this notion that the white Anglo settler is defining everyone else in order to define themselves, right? They are creating these identities for other people in order for them to know what they are not. But what is missing in that discussion is what they are. And oftentimes that conversation can be really uncomfortable when you ask white people, right, or a white person, about their culture, right? What What is your, right, when, when you start seeing people adopt certain practices or certain customs of another culture and you're thinking, well, what about your own? What What is your heritage? What are your roots? What, what do you connect to that isn't the legacy of genocide and colonization? 
I think that would be a great question to ask and a great question for anyone to consider, um, even if you're not white. <laughs> what do you think about the term mestizo? Oh, the term mestizo, I think, um, it's, a, it's a difficult question to answer because for a long time I also identified as mestiza um, because I assumed that somewhere along my like ancestry lineage there had to be a Spaniard in the mix because of my last name. Um, and then I learned that my great-grandmother actually made up her last name, her maiden name. She had to provide a Spanish surname in order for my grandparents to go to school, to get an education. And therefore, um, her last name, which is not my last name, um, is not real. She saw it on like a pack of some, some item that she found. She adopted that name. And she also adopted her first name um, on her favorite flower. So her name was Rosa for most of her life, even though she, I'm sure she had a Nahua name that I don't know, that her children don't know, um, and that is now lost, right? So the term mestiza, I think, is a little problematic to assume, right, that a lot of Mexicans um, are mestizo because we simply don't know. Like, we don't know the, the history of people. And I think if people want to use that term, um, I think they have the right to, um, if they want to um, reclaim a term that was created by uh, the Hispanic settler elites in Mexico, if they want to use that term to describe themselves, because there is a mixture of um, Spanish and indigenous uh, peoples in their histories, I think it's, it's really up to them. So that term, I think, is still, um, I would leave it up to debate for people in terms of self-identifying. However, I would not recommend um, anyone who's not Mexican-American or of that descent to use that freely to um, describe other people. Yes. I, I have two questions, and I know your lecture didn't go that far back, but some of the leading families uh, after the secularization of the missions, the Picos, you know, the Verdugos, the, the Carrillos, you know, acquire branches and land. And I think we're just as culpable as Euro Americans in terms of exploiting indigenous labor, because that was the labor that was available. I just wanted to know what your thoughts. Oh, on that. absolutely, 100%. Um, one of the things mm -hmm. that I yeah I didn't mention because we didn't go that far back, mm -hmm. um, but a lot of the people who were able to um, retain ownership of their land were, uh, in terms of Mexican citizens who were now Mexican Americans were Mexicans who came from elite wealthy families. They were able to retain ownership of their land because they already had this um, official historical record of owning it, of having taken it from someone else, um, and of having uh, servants and slaves build those homes and maintain those lands. So th that's why when I said, um, let me go back to that slide. <clears throat> Right? The white Hispanic settler nation and the white Anglo settler nation. Um, this is why I think it's important to, like when you think about Mexico, right, uh, don't just focus on the cultural aspects that are familiar to you as being some generalized um, thing amongst Mexicans. Because Mexico was also a settler, well is also a settler nation. Um, and therefore, the white Hispanic settlers who did settle in the lands that are now um, California and the rest of the Southwest, they are just as culpable. They um, also participated in the eradication of Native American people and in the enslavement of black people. Um, and so, yes, I agree. <laughs> they are very cool. And my second question is, on my birth certificate, I was born in the early, in the 60s, early 60s. My race is white, and my mother's race is white, and my mother's people 
are indigenous people. They're from the Wachundi people in central California. And my dad, and even I looked at my, my grandmother, who was born in 1897 in Colorado, who was indigenous, although they didn't like to accept that term. But they like to call themselves Spanish, and I'm sure you're familiar with that, in particular people from Colorado and New Mexico. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea or any views on why that was the case? That, you know, because I'm not white, you know, and you know, I got nothing against white people, but it's just, you know, my son looks at it and he goes, Dad, he goes, you're white. And I said, well, you know, I don't think I was ever treated as if I was white when I was a kid. But why, do you know any, do you know why that was, the categories that were assigned people uh, on their birth certificate? Um, yes, it is because they, um, were legally white, right? So um, in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, in order for a Mexican American to claim citizenship, they also had to claim whiteness because according to the uh, Constitution of the United States, only white citizens were allowed to um, obtain citizenship. And so for a lot of people, like I uh, mentioned, it was easier to claim their proximity to whiteness than their proximity to indigeneity or blackness because those things would automatically um, put them at a lower stratification in terms of the social hierarchy in the developing state. And so for a lot of people it becomes easier to claim whiteness. Um, and because that becomes sort of a official record from this period, right, like the early 1800s and mid-1800s, it becomes standard practice throughout as the years go by. For example, I, I lived in Houston, Texas about six years ago and I went to do my taxes and the guy who was doing my taxes filled out the race part for me and he put white. And I said, where? What do you mean? And he said, well, you're Mexican, right? And I said, yes. And he said, are you Native American? And I said, what do you mean? Yes. And he said, what tribe? And because I couldn't answer, right? Nahua is a um, Mexican indigenous peoples. It does, it's not recognized as indigenous peoples in the United States. And therefore, to this man, I was white. I couldn't claim native, indigenous, um, what else did they add, like Alaska native or something like that. Um, I couldn't claim that. And therefore, this man who doesn't know me, who doesn't know anything about my history, was able to make that um, declaration for me on a uh, official government document, right? So in the eyes of the United States in my uh, tax form of like 2014 or something, I am white. And Welcome to the place. Thank you. <laughs> if only I could be white in other ways or perceived as white. No, I don't want to be perceived as white. Um, the other uh, part of your question about the term Spanish, right? Mm -hmm. um, referring to people as Spanish. I think that is largely, um, again, part of the laziness of the Anglo settler to create complex identities for people who are not white, who do not speak English. It's easier to identify someone as the, the language that they speak, right? You speak Spanish, you're Spanish. You weren't born in Spain, you have no family from Spain, but you speak Spanish, so you're Spanish. Um, and again, this is something that I think is I think it's starting to become less common now, the um, practice of calling uh, Mexicans or Latinos, like Latinas, um, Spanish has become kind of like, you don't do that. Um, however, the term Hispanic is still uh, pretty much uh, common amongst the United States. And again, that is a indicator of the language you speak, not your ethnicity, not your race. Um, simply the language. And the term also combines, right, the colonizer and the colonized. And so that term Hispanic or calling someone Spanish 
um, who is brown, who has indigenous heritage, um, is problematic because you are essentially lumping someone in with their colonizer and saying you have a shared identity, which is not the case at all. Yes? You're not going to know during the settlement that you're talking about, were Indians um, referred to Mexicans or were they referred to Indians? Because I think it's, and I would like to do some research on my part, because I think it's interesting how there's like indigenous people that don't consider themselves Mexican. And you ask them and they're like, no, I'm not Mexican, I'm Indian. So I just, I'm like, we're, I'm like curious about where that comes from and maybe I'm like, but what is your opinion? Um, I know that uh, today, right, a lot of people who claim indigeneity and reject um, Mexican nationality do so because they're rejecting the uh, labels that were provided by the colonizers, by the settlers. And so, like I said earlier, um, I used to identify as Mexican. I used to identify as Mexican-American. And I no longer do so because um, I don't want my identity to be centralized around what some Hispanic and Anglo settlers thought about my ancestors hundreds of years ago, right? So um, there are people, this is, this is where like, it, this, like if you did research, um, which I fully encourage you to do because it is very enlightening, also very depressing, um, but when, if you do research, you will get to a point where you will get so frustrated because you cannot tell who is Mexican and who is indigenous, who they're talking about when they mention Mexicans, who they're talking about when they mention Indians, right? Um, for example, in Mexico, if you refer to someone as an Indio, you have a very um, clear idea of the person that is being talked about, right? Someone with dark skin, someone with um, indigenous features, uh, probably uneducated, um, low income, uh, from um, the countryside, from a pueblo, from um, not an elite family. Um, however, that same image in the United States is a Mexican. And so it becomes really difficult to distinguish because these Again, it's the, it's the imagination of the settlers, right? And it's, it's blending people in that didn't ask to be blended. It's, it's um, reductive of people's identities, and therefore sometimes people just choose to reject those identities, at, like straight up. Um, and so it's, like I said, like I also mentioned earlier, right, with the, with the Chicano label, there are a lot of indigenous people who claim the Chicano, Chicanex label now, um, and even in the 70s and the 60s, because they felt like their lived experience was very similar to the Mexican Americans who were claiming that identity, and therefore it made more sense for them to be, to self-identify as Chicano than Native or Indigenous if they didn't know what specific um, Indigenous community or nation they come from. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it, like I said, it just, at a certain point, it doesn't make any sense. You get to a point in history where everybody is everything and also nothing. So, uh, yeah, I apologize if that answer was also as unclear, but that's because the, the material is unclear. But I mean, when they were killing the indigenous people, were they referred to as Mexicans or like Indians? Were they, like, what, what, what were they called? They were um, referred to as Indians. Oh. Yeah. Um, and these were people who were specifically either in um, native communities, native tribes, or who were um, part of the mission system as indentured servants, or children who were in. Um, Native American boarding schools, right? These are people who have a direct connection to um, the indigenous population, right? They're like one step removed. They're either children or they're living, um, they're part of a living indigenous community. Uh, Mexicans who didn't have that direct connection were often not referred to as indigenous in the United States, but again in Mexico, right? 
if you're brown and you have certain facial features, you're an Indio. Um, but because the discourse changed once the land uh, became U.S. territory, those things also start to change. But yes, um, indigenous people in the U.S. were referred to as Indians. Yes. Um, I just wanted to say that I think that the, the choice of white as, as race is a kind of a default choice because, I mean, today I often choose other because I'm not white, I'm not black, I'm none of the categories, so I choose other. And for lack of a better term, for lack of an option, I consider myself mestiza because, because I am like 40% indigenous and 40% Spanish and a bunch of other stuff including black from, you know, from Africa. So um, it, it's, it's, I, it is very difficult to identify, to find something that you can use. You know, I kind of have layers of identity from Chicana to Mexican American to La Latina, you know, and I kind of have this hierarchy of activities, of, of activities, of designations that I use and accept because it is so hard to yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting because um, i say like from personal experience, right, all those different identifiers, um, it's like depending on the circumstance that you're in, the social situation, you'll choose to identify as this or as that, right, you'll um, like a well, the identity doesn't change, but the label changes. The label changes. Right. And, but also like with the label, um, there is kind of a change in perception of you by others, right? So if I'm with a group of friends and I and we're talking about being brown and indigenous, like we know what we're talking about. If I'm with a group of people who maybe, you know, it's a more professional setting and I say back, you know, a couple years ago and I would say, oh, I'm Latinx, um, I'm Mexican American, it becomes a little bit more of a respectable identity, right? So this is like a choosing when and where to bring up the respectability politics portion of this discourse, right? What, how is my perception, how is the perception of myself going to change based on the identity that I choose? And um, I think it's so funny choosing other on documents because um, it is kind of like you're rejecting all of those identifiers and being okay with the fact that your identity, the title for your identity doesn't exist within the settler imagination and therefore it cannot be um, you can't just write it in. Um, so yeah, it's a very it's a very tricky thing for a lot of people, um, and I think for anyone who's not who doesn't have that experience of having to choose which one you're going to be today, like you're spinning a wheel and like whatever it lands on today, I'm Mexican. Today I'm white. Today I'm other. Um, to just think about, you know, how your perceptions of other people change when you hear these different identifiers, right? What do you think when you hear someone identify themselves as um, Mexican American or Latinx or Chicano or Latine or um, any of these terms, right? Even if you hear somebody refer to themselves as, as Hispanic or Spanish, right? People, there are still people who, who do that, who have absolutely no problem doing that. And um, yeah, just considering like how your perception changes of that person. Um, and if you're that person, right, how the perception of yourself is constantly changing in the eyes of others. Yep. More of a comment, but because people gave us all of those different labels, we chose the term Chicano as Chicano students in the 60s. You know, we identify with Chicano, and I, I'm still Chicano. I mean, mm -hmm. with all of those things that are on and, but, I am becoming more, I accept whatever. I know what I call myself, but if people call me Mexican or Mexican-American, uh, when I was younger, it might have been a little bit more of a, like, don't say that. I mean, it's not as, it's not as important to me today. I know who I am, and we've, we have lived that experience. You know, Latinx and Chickenx and all of that is in, our, in my peer group. Okay, so we're in our 70s, but we were, you know, we, I graduated from Long Beach State in, in uh, 1970, so, 
and we established Chicago studies right. and we did a lot of things there. But <clears throat> so amongst ourselves, you know, all of this is kind of, it's, it, 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 it takes on a little bit more of a, uh, a comical type of, you know, what, where are we being called today? You know? Yeah. Because yeah, I'm not sure what Latinx or Chickenx, uh, obviously the O and the, uh, and the A, I understand that and I accept it. So <coughs> whatever people want to call themselves, uh, but fundamentally I still believe that, you know, again, that we are American. So I'm teaching my grandchildren, they're American. Mm -hmm. And we, I mean, and carry it. This is, American is brown, in my mind, because that's who I am. But it, I also accept all the other colors of the rainbow that are also American. I mean, it's not exclusive in my, in, in my imagination, it's not so. Right. And I think that's a very common thing for um, people who grew up in that political time, right, where uh, the term Chicano was... Uh, forming and it had a lot of uh, political weight, right? Okay. You're you're choosing to identify yourself and your community um, as something that the white Anglo settler did not come up with, and I think that holds a lot of um, a lot of symbolic, in some ways. Um, agency, right? Like you get to choose that you're the person who's who's choosing the name that you want. And then later generations, um, I think, inspired by your generation say, me too, like I, you know, I, I maybe I don't like the term Chicano. Yeah. Maybe I think that term is too, um, it's too adherent to a gender binary, or a um, still a, a <laughs> subtler mindset solar imagination and um so i sometimes because i was born in mexico i will um identify as latinx right and i i love that term because it is so silly and because it doesn't make sense and because it is an absolute act of disrespect to the spanish language right it's impossible like people are like how do you pronounce this i i don't know like that's not how Spanish works. Spanish has a gender neutral option already. And the point isn't to have this term exist in, like, in, in a respectable way with the Spanish language. It is, it, it's, it's a direct affront to the Spanish language, to the, to the colonizer's language and saying, I don't respect your language. So I'm going to change it. And it's going to make sense to me, and it's going to make sense to my peers and to other people who maybe aren't from Latin America, but who are queer and who want to be recognized um, as being queer, um, as being non-binary. Um, so I think, uh, right, in a couple of years, there will be another term, and there will be more terms. And as long as they are terms that are being defined and created by um, by the people who are being affected by them, I think it, you know it doesn't really matter. Um, and I think the only thing is to you know not take on the mindset of the colonizer and say, no, this is the term you have to be this, right? To have an open mind and say, okay, well, um, I have the freedom and ability to define myself, my friends have the ability to define themselves, and I want future generations to continue to have that ability. And if they challenge my definitions, then that's perfect, because it's making my own assumptions of who I am, it's, it's broadening them, right? It's opening up a, a bigger space to include more people. And so, um, yeah, I think, you know, we have a lot to owe to your generation for, for having that bravery right to stand up to the um colonizer discourse and say like i'm not going to accept your terms and i'm going to create my own and yeah i think that's like the legacy of your generation which is um i mean i i wouldn't be here doing this lecture if it weren't that well it's um 4 p.m now and i wanted to thank andrea and thank you all for coming today And we'll continue the speaker series on June 18th is the next one scheduled by
So thank you so much again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah.